Adam Mann, a legendary artist, is one of the most commercially and artistically successful recording artists from this post-punk era of music. And now he's back in music. He's about to start a new tour and a new album. Uh, and before we get into it, I want to ask you about your genre, because I've seen you identified uh, as a post-punk artist, as a British romantic. How do you describe your music? Um, well, I, I called it ant, ant music for that reason, right at the very start, because I realized it was going to get called something. So I kind of got in first. But I get kind of collared into the new romantic era, which certainly I'm not. It, was, it really began in 1977 with the Sex Pistols and um, the punk movement. So I suppose it's punk, post-punk would be the most accurate period of time to, of that, that ilk. So I'd say I'm a sort of uh, post-punk musician, I suppose. Okay, so yeah. those are your words that's and my, your, that's how your I'm, description. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> so you have a new album out. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a band, a new band. You were Adam and the Ants, the legendary group. Uh, what's the name of the new band? Because it's kind of magnificently weird yeah um well it's called the good the mad and the lovely posse and it's kind of uh, a bit of a sort of uh, nod to clint eastwood who i'm a big fan of and those kind of spaghetti westerns <laughs> and uh they're you know there's six of us and we uh two drummers i still maintain the two drummers i've got a lady drummer called yola in the band and andy they they keep that sort of rhythm going and um you know tom and joe and myself so it, it uh, and georgie girl so it's a it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm really happy with it. They're a young bunch of kids, all sort of desperate to come over and, and uh, see America. They've never been to the USA apart from one of them who's done a few gigs. So. And you're doing quite a few dates in the US. Yeah, 23, I think, 22, 23. Some of these shows, a lot of these shows actually are sold out. Uh-huh, yeah. What, uh, who is your audience? Are you, are you drawing upon the die-hard, you know, cult following that you built? And, and mixing that in with some, some young people that are fascinated with the, the phenomenon of the 80s? I, th I think it's, it really is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, constantly surprised by the, um, the audiences looking out in the first few rows, you know, the, the, the age, the, you know, the, it's so varied. The demographic of it is, is completely different because now, I think it's partly due down to the number of festivals we have. Because when you play a festival, it's not necessarily your audience, you're one of many people. So you're playing to other people's audiences and that's a very great challenge and you can actually, you know, steal an audience there. You can go yeah. and play your stuff and they're like, oh, I've never seen this guy, but what's this about? And oh, I'll check him out online and what, what album there, there are. So it, 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 it's, it, that's, I think, a very integral change for me in the live circuit because, you know, you obviously you've got people that bought the record, they've got kids now. But there's this sort of middle ground of, 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 of people that just love music and love going to live concerts. So hopefully they'll, um, they'll come along, so we'll see. All across the world, in Europe, in New York, in LA, uh, you're seeing this resurgence of the 80s uh, with the young people really starting to, to grasp on uh, to that time period. Does that surprise you? Um, not really, I think it, I think, uh, Every kind of gen every sort of 10 to 15 years, there's like a new movement. There's a new sort of, I mean, for me, the last one would have been punk rock, the important one that comes along. But it did, most of the people that made the music in the 80s had started in, in the kind of punk era. You know, Dexys Midnight Runners, Spandau Ballet, they'd all been around that time. But I think the thing that the 80s uh, musicians had was the, the challenge of the three and a half minute single. Hmm. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't pretentious. It was kind of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, chorus, chorus. It was really banging that chorus home. All the, the songs seemed to have a very single orientated um, direction. And I think they're very good pure pop songs, you know. Um, and I think that's why they, they last. And when people go out and hear them, I think it's very accessible to anybody that just wants to have a good time, you know. Um, and even Madonna now, you know, Madonna's still going out there and has enormous influence on people like Gaga, who's really the, the second generation of that kind of pop single and that look. And everybody did make an attempt to look a certain way. They kind of dressed up for the occasion. So maybe it's that, I don't know. And when, when I think about that look, uh, the guys, some of the guys from your era that you seem to influence, uh, Prince, Michael Jackson, mm. Uh, if you go back and you look at some of the, the style cues that they mm. use, they're very similar uh, mm. to Adam Ant. 
Mm. Uh, how did you feel about that? You know, I was very fortunate through um, to appear on the Motown 25 show. With, uh, I was asked by Suzanne DePass at um, Motown Records and met Barry Gordy and stayed with Barry and, you know, meeting people like Smokey Robinson and these are people that, you know, are heroes to me. And then I got asked to do this show and uh, through that got to know Michael Jackson and spent a day at his home. And of course that was the legendary yeah. moonwalk performance that Michael Jackson did. You know, and, and, and then through that he asked me, you know, he asked me where I got the, the brocade jackets and uh, so I gave him the number of my guy in London. So I went to see him. And Prince, uh, there was a contact through um, Vanity, who I was, who I'd, uh, I, I'd a, I was dating at the time. So I knew Prince kind of quite early on. And I'd, I'd, I'd known about Prince since controversy on a sort of underground level. Um, so these are, these are all things that are, are very, um, you know, if there was any influence, then I'm, I'm very, very flattered by that. In as much as uh, I hope the people that I was influenced by are flattered by the fact that I, I was influenced by them. I, I think it's a, it's a progressive thing. How were you influenced by them? Um, well, I mean, I was influenced certainly by uh, Tamala Motown records because when I was a kid, I lived in a kind of uh, estate, you know, a uh, big sort of block, and I'd be up on the fourth floor doing my Latin homework. And all my friends um, were out at the club downstairs dancing to Tamla Motown records. It was it was mainly you know Smokey Robinson and Marvin Gaye and David Ruffin. Four Tops. Every, it was you know I must have heard Band of Gold about a thousand times. <laughs> so it was going in all, all the time. It was sort of going in, and, and these are um, I think that's where you 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 must learn. A you, you get a love of music, great music, but to, act, to actually have to go on stage and perform on the same stage as these people that you you'd grown up with was was. Um, uh, probably the most challenging concert I've ever, ever, ever been involved with, and, and, and the most memorable. I'll never forget that that time. Oh, and, and you were performing uh, with this traditionally uh, black music label, mm -hmm, mm. Uh, influence, uh, influencing black artists and the mm. style cues that they were taking. So you mm. really crossed crossed over in many ways. Yeah, and also now the other thing, spending time with Barry Gordy, just talking to him about. I'd ask them about how they um, made the Tamla records and how they mixed them. And um, when I, because I, I did a cover of Baby Where Did I Love Go, and uh, during the performance, Diana Ross actually came on and announced and danced with me, which was a, a nice nod. But, yeah. but I, uh, the Gillaski Orchestra, I worked with them, who'd worked on all the original Tamla songs. And, and talking to Barry, how they used to listen, listen to the records and how they'd listen to the mixes. and. Um, learning a lot about how to run a record company and now I've got my own label, yes. my own boutique label. A lot of the stuff that he pioneered, uh, certainly with his, his artist, is uh, helping me now a great deal. And you are, uh, you know, I do the business of celebrity, I talk a lot about that. And you've moved into this kind of entrepreneurial role now as the head of a record company. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how does that feel? Do you feel like your experience in the industry has prepared you for this? Um, yeah, I think the experience has sort of left me with the... Uh, I, I've learned when to say no. I've learned how to say no and kind of mean it. And I won't be rushed on things. And I've got one band signed to my label, uh, Georgie Girl and her Pousse Posse. And they, they come out and they, they, they open up for me. So they've played like 50 shows with me. And, and, and unusually in this day and age, it's, they've got so much live experience as a band, four-piece four girl band out there, and they look great, and they go and they, they play every night, and they're paying their dues, which is the reverse from what most record companies do with a girl band. They just sort of put the backing track together and they, they sing. So it has, it, it, you know, when, when you're responsible to other musicians who've got dreams and you're writing with them, producing them, you know, you learn to you learn to care and you also learn that it's quite a commitment. It is a great commitment. In your autobiography, Stand and Deliver, mm -hmm. uh, you talked about being dropped from your record company mm -hmm. uh, after having so much commercial success. And, and this really stood out to me. You said, if we couldn't agree on how to work together, then I would quit the label at that moment. Mm -hmm. I knew I was stone cold as a commercial prospect and I was floored by a tidal wave of depression uh, when you saw your record sales drop, mm -hmm. um, what was that experience like, and what caused it? Um, 
I think it was really not taking a break between albums. I think, if anything, possibly Retrospect's a wonderful thing, but had Adam and the Ants as a band had a nine-month period between Kings of the World Frontier and Prince Charming albums, we would have stayed together. There's no question. We were just exhausted. Uh, you get to a point where you just get sick of the sight of each other, and there was no <laughs> one to say, there was no one to say, stop. No one's going to say stop because you're earning so much money right. for the label. No one actually says, look, you know, stop. And then I just went ahead and made like four consecutive solo albums. You know, bang, 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 bang. So by the time it came to that um, situation with my record label, I was actually in America and uh, I realised that they would pulled the plug on the album. They, they, they pulled it. So I completed the tour, went back to the UK and said simply, you know, why, why did you do that? You know, because... Um, and no one ever told you we're going to pull the no, plug that, that, out. There, there's a feeling you can get you can get pulled, and I think you are signed to a very ten album, very archaic. It's a bit like the old Hollywood film system. You know, you're contracted. You're on a very, um, a very, a very prohibitive contract if it's not going very well. So f I just had to more or less buy my way out of the contract. I had to sort of, and I couldn't work for a couple of years, well, quite a few years, until that was cleared up. Um, but no one likes to, uh, you know, if, you're, if you compete, it's like saying to an athlete, well, how do you feel about coming in third? Yeah. It shouldn't really be like that. And I don't feel that way now. Chart positions aren't what it's about now. It's about, you know, making the records I want to make and getting them to the people that want them and performing live, you know. But in, those, in that mentality, I sort of bought into that whole um, competitiveness. And uh, it was very difficult at that time. Mm -hmm. When you look back, Billy Idol, Depeche <coughs> Mode, mm -hmm. Prince, mm -hmm. all of these guys that were kind of around your era mm -hmm. are still very famous mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that say about the era that you started? Um, well, I think it's, um, I think it's four things, you know, success, survival, longevity, consistency. You know, you got success, you survived, you've been around a long time, but being consistent is, is the hardest thing. And all the people you've named have consistently brought out good work. They, brought out, they put their best shot out, they put their best work out. They've never, as I can see it, cheated on their audience, and the audience pick up on that. Um, so I think, you know, if someone's willing to do that and be honest about it and tell the truth, it's... Um, you know, you can survive, you can have a long career. And does it, does it concern you that uh, MTV really doesn't play videos anymore? And it, it's, videos are made, but they don't have the same amount of distribution and influence that they used mm. to have. And since that's such a big part of your yeah. uh, model, mm. how will you deal with that? Well, I think in, in, all, in all sensibility, uh, it's, um, I think MTV, it, it, the, the video boom as everything, it peaked at a certain point. I think it went from silent film, let's say metaphorically, from silent film um, to talkies to colour within three years. It just went rocketed and, and it became a bit of a monster anyway. And I think however good the video was, it, it, it still became a question of how much the thing cost, who was directing it. It became kind of Hollywood thing. And you can't compete against, say, John Landis and people like that. It's not, not going to work. So having it brought that in, I think now it's, uh, it's still a useful tool to do a video so people can actually see it before you come to play for them live. And the difference now is to play for them live. You have to get out there and play live um, or you can't survive in the business. So fortunately, I like doing that. Are you making videos for this? Yeah, I'm going to make a promotional video for this, uh, for the single when it comes out. Um, yeah, because I think you have to. I think it's a, you know, it's a an interpretation of, of the lyric, and um, it will show the new band off before we come into town. So I'll do it anyway, because I think it needs to be done. I want to talk uh, just briefly about uh, mental illness mm -hmm. and the role that it's played uh, in your life and career, because if I'm not mistaken, that was really a big part of the reason why you were away yeah, uh, for certainly. so long. Um, you're very passionate about music. There was a point where you said you sort of lost your mental health because you pushed yourself so hard. Mm. Uh, I believed it would all end tomorrow, so I worked instead of having a break. No one advised me to have a break. Mm -hmm. And so you had these pre-existing mental illness issues, mm -hmm. and then when you sort of 
got so big in the music industry, mm. that sort of exacerbated things. Absolutely. Tell me about that experience and how do you avoid that happening this time out? Uh, well, I think A, it's understanding what's happening to you. It's quite, unfortunately with mental illness, it's um, in my view, the ultimate taboo. And it's the one that we don't really know enough about to be clear. Um, because it deals with a very complicated organ, the brain, which we know very little about. But these things, for in my case, I, 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 I have to look back and try and, you know, decipher the reasons why, what led up to it. And I think primarily, really not taking a break between uh, albums. I'd go out straight out of one into the next and never took a break at all. And it, it becomes a bit of a dark cloud. Instead of it being, um, a brightness and an exciting thing that it was at the start. You suddenly got a, oh, the last record went to this, got to this point, next one's got to be bigger. Um, and also you don't do the things I think that are, are critical, which is, I mean, I've got a dog, I take my dog out, see your family, see your friends, be able to, when you have a, a problem, speak to your closest, your, your family or your friends, because they look at you as being quite a strong person because you're successful. So you don't feel you know, they're quite shocked when you actually open your heart and say, well, it, I'm at the top here, but I'm really not enjoying this. In the early 80s, you had this sudden fame mm -hmm. uh, and almost overnight wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that affect you? Uh, well, you know, you, uh, you work for three years and then you go on one television show. We went on this show in England called Top of the Pops and um, the public made their mind up for the first time. They, you know, the general public had seen it on television and suddenly it's boom and there is no school to prepare you for that. There's no, no one can, pre <laughs> <laughs> it's like fatherhood. It, you, it, I asked my doctor, said, you know, how will I, what will I do? And said, no one can prepare you for your own. And you cannot prepare yourself for that kind of thing happening to you. You just have to kind of um, button down the hatches and, uh, and, and keep trying, keep focused. And in my case, it was just work, just work very, very hard and, um, you know, don't don't let people uh, influence the the actual work you're doing just for commercial reasons. Oh, why don't you make a record that sounds a bit housey, or why don't you make a because it's not me. I want to make right. this kind of record. So it was it it made me. Uh, I had the advantage of three years of rejection to get a, hmm. the go ahead. It's all, okay. I'm off, and I, I I just really embraced it and got on with it. I think that you've hit on uh, the key to your success. Uh, which is that you created you. Mm. You weren't handled. You were somebody that had a vision for what you wanted to be. You wanted to be ahead of the curve. Mm. Uh, and you seem to have that mindset still mm. as you sit across from me talking about your new project. Mm. Uh, how do you accomplish that? How do you come out and, and terrify audiences <laughs> in the way that you <clears throat> used to uh, so long ago? Uh, I, I think that it's it's purely, um, I still look at it as a challenge every night, every single show for me is, um, I have to give it my best shot because you know, you, who knows, you might fall off the stage, something, something will happen. But it, it's, I think once I'm comfortable with it, once I think, oh, you know, it's, it's fine, I'm there, then it's time to get out. So hopefully I'll be singing um, until, I, until I sort of drop, until I stop wanting to do it. But until that time, it's, uh, it's a challenge for me. And when there's a challenge, there's always that, it never gets boring. It's never been boring to me. I've never had to force myself to go on stage, ever. And finally, mm. how, how have you handled the business and the financial side of your affairs uh, as a musician? Do you feel that you could have done better? Have you done well with it? Or, and do you see this next time going out as an opportunity to really capitalize? Um, I think, Possibly the worst decision that I made was signing the, the contract that I signed when I started out because it was uh, so prohibitive in terms of, you know, it was so one-sided, um, but that was the, the sort of contract that all artists signed. And I read a lot about, you know, some of the artists before me, Johnny Cash and, you know, some of the, the greats and, and the contracts they signed were even worse. But that's changed now because most artists have their own label or they're, they're independent. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased as much as I earned enough money to take care of my family and um, not have to do a job. 
because I've never really had a job. This isn't a job to me, it's work, and there's a difference. So I, I think that um, I, did, I was surprised to make any money out of music at all. So it's what been did that quite first good. contract, how did it constrict you? Well, it kind of roughly worked out that every, every pound that I made, I was getting less than nine pence. I mean, that's not for very good business, really. In fact, it's terrible business. Um, that affects you in retrospect. You look back years later because you sort of come to a point and then you, you start spending more time with lawyers and accountants than you do with your band because you've got to take care of business later on, but the damage is almost done. So it's kind of trying to repair things. Um, and uh, it, it, it's not a very good feeling knowing that you've, you've signed a disastrous uh, contract. Um, well, I thought it was, but I, I'm, I'm sure most musicians feel that. But it, it was the norm, let me stress, that was a normal kind of contract. Um, I think the business has changed now. Can um, you diversify into other, I mean, like fashion? I mean, you're, you're a fashion guy. Yeah, well, the, um, the outfit that I'm wearing on the um, stage, I've been wearing for the last sort of year, and what I'm wearing on stage is, um, I have I designed that and have that made. So hopefully that will be um, available sometime in the future at some point. Although it's quite expensive, it's not the sort of stuff you could buy in a, because it's brocade and everything. But that's, that's something in the future that I'd like to do, and I have plans to do that when the time's right. All right, well, we look forward to hearing this new album. Thank you. To catching you on your U.S. tour. Mm -hmm. You look good. Thank you. Uh, too bad we haven't been able to hear uh, the record, but I expect that uh, it's going to be um, consistent with the, the quality of music that you put out in your career so far. Thank you very much. So, thank th you. Adam Ant, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much indeed. And thank with you. Adam Ant, I'm Lee Hawkins. We'll see you next time. If you're doing something right, it connects. I live by something I call the law of commonality. I've never been, I've never been criticized. I've been critiqued. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, on it. Uh, 